And uh, I want to welcome everyone. Uh, this is Frederick Winston with Night Hope. Um, I want to wel uh, welcome you to yet another uh, webinar in the Night Hope Solutions Center webinar series. Today we're going to hear from World Vision Canada, Easy Projects, and Net Hope uh, on um, digital transformation journeys and um, how to get started, how to take the next step, and um, uh, so on. Uh, before we get started, I want to just go over the, the normal housekeeping um, uh, uh, elements. We want to keep this interactive, so uh, please open up the uh, chat window in WebEx. Uh, go to the um, um, go to the little uh, bubble on the bottom of your screen, the little blue uh, icon. Click on that, and uh, you'll see the chat window on the right-hand side. And you can post your questions there, and we'll address those in the Q&A session towards the end of the hour. We are recording this session today, so uh, uh, please um, uh, 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 look for a follow-up email from us with the recording and link to the slides and the collateral for the session. Also, at the end of the session today, you will see a webinar satisfaction poll pop up in your browser. We'd certainly appreciate you spending a minute or two answering those questions so we can uh, improve this webinar series as we move forward uh, based on your feedback. So without any further ado, I want to introduce, introduce the speakers today. Adam Krasinski, he is the Director of Digital Transformation at World Vision Canada. We have Scott Tomlinson, Head of Marketing at Easy Projects. And we have J.L. Eckhart, he is the Chief Innovation Officer at NetHope. And uh, we're going to be listening to them, having a little bit of a fireside chat. And uh, I will uh, uh, pass the control over to Scott. So why don't you take it away, Scott? Uh, thank you, Frederick. Uh, welcome, everyone. Glad you can join us today um, on this interactive chat. Again, I'm Scott Tollinson, Head of Marketing Easy Projects. Uh, today, our panel uh, will explore and deep dive the subject of digital transformation from the perspective of an NGO. Uh, and we're going to include someone who is living in the trenches today and is experiencing this journey right now uh, in the form of World Vision Canada and Adam, uh, who's been living this journey for the last three years. Uh, we're going to explore the question of why. Why digitally transform? Uh, we'll hopefully answer that question for you. Uh, and also then we'll dive into a, a discussion around how do you start, how can you take some initial steps. We'll conclude with some reflections of the current journey to date with World Vision Canada and conclude with some uh, final words of wisdom that you can apply to your own uh, journey. Oh, sorry, let me just flip the slide here. So Adam, uh, thank you for taking the time today to be with us to share your experience. Um, you've been le living uh, digital transformation as director of uh, DT at World Vision Canada, as we said, for the last three years. Maybe before sharing your journey with members, let's define digital transformation. Let's ground so we can ground you know that in the discussion. So in your mind, what is the definition of digital transformation? Hey Scott, thanks for for having me here. Excited and humbled. Uh, this is like by far my favorite party starter conversation. What do you do for a living? I do digital transformation. What is that? Uh, and I do have a visual, thanks for sharing it, Scott, that I use to articulate something high complex. And I use this visual saying, well, digital transformation is like this weird, strange, mysterious creature. And we all have different uh, reactions to this creature. Some of us are bewildered, confused, some of us are excited, some of us see the horns, some of us see the colors, the round belly. And but we all think it's strange and weird and we don't know what it is. And most people will have different vantage points on what this creature is, same way how multiple people have multiple vantage points on what digital transformation is. And they will often have the vantage point that they is more familiar with them. That's uh, that is uh, closer to them. So you may have a person that is a technology person, an IT person, and they understand this creature through technology. Then you're gonna, you may have a marketing person that understands this creature from, through customer centricity, for example. You may have an entrepreneur that looks at this creature and thinks, oh, this is a potential to disrupt. So 
we all have different kind of vantage points, or different points of view on what this feature is. And again, different reactions. Some of them are uncomfortable and scary, and some of them are excited. So that's what I kind of use to explain something uh, like this. And especially because it keeps changing. So two more than the addition may, may, may be different. Well, I think that analogy is quite perfect. And I'm sure uh, many of the members in the audience, they can relate to that. The, the sense of unknown, the sense of change, the sense of uh, changing color, evolving, you know, et cetera. And it really becomes, or can become very personal uh, to you, depending on your own uh, perspective. Uh, JL, uh, welcome to the panel, um, and thank you for your time today. I'd like to get uh, your perspective on this. You work with nonprofits probably on a daily basis, you know, on this topic. So, can you talk to us a bit about how do you see, or how NGOs see, they relating to this topic? Um, sure, um, Scott. Uh, just give me a, a sound check to make sure that um, you can hear me well. I can hear you well. Great. And so um, I selected this Azure diagram because, as Scott mentioned, um, you know, it, it is a multifaceted animal. It is a multifaceted animal that changes because, in fact, it is transformation. It goes from one state to another. And um, in that transition from one state to another, what is it important to understand that there is a lot of ambiguity in the middle, here represented is um, whether you're a fish or a bird and your eye has difficulty really working it out in the middle. At the top, it's pretty clear, and at the bottom, it's pretty clear. As I often say, you know, when you have digitally transformed, you'll know it. It's a little bit like happiness, right? You know when you have it, but try to explain the path to get there, and it might not be that clear. And more importantly, the path you took to get there might not be the path that somebody else took to get there. And so in order to get through that zone of ambiguity and not get lost in the process, we need lots of references from our peers, such as the one that Scott is sharing with us today. Great. Uh, thanks, Jail. You know, I'm really glad to hear you know, digital transformation is a multifaceted approach. Uh, I think at times we, uh, at the media and ourselves, we kind of lock into this word digital, and we automatically think that it's a pure technology uh, solution or pure technology approach, um, where you can just kind of maybe some sprinkle some tech and, you know, voila, problem solved or instantly digitally trans transformed. So I'm really excited um, to hear that we're going to talk about different elements, uh, at least that's how it's sounding uh, from the two of you, that it's going to go beyond technology and it's more of a multifaceted, holistic approach. Um, to your organization. So I'm guessing we're going to be talking about people and, and processes um, pretty quick. So let's uh, move on uh, and let's start talk about how, you know, starting points. Uh, I think sometimes it's very hard to start. You know you need to start. You're not sure how. And I think digital transformation is a great example of sometimes you want to go see the waterfall in a forest that maybe you haven't explored uh, at all, it's your first time, you're staring at the edge of it, and you're wondering, how do I get there? You don't know the terrain, uh, but you know where you want to get to, and there's probably many ways uh, to get there. So Adam, uh, you, when you became Director of Digital Transformation, uh, can you give a sense, uh, you know, give a sense to the audience of how World Vision Canada arrived at the decision to digitally transform, and then perhaps then discuss the initial steps that uh, you took on your journey uh, to transform. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would say my experience with World Vision, similar to my previous experience of digital transformation, the journey starts with the why. The journey starts with a compelling reason to change. And in most cases, the compelling reason is the customer, the customer embracing digital and changing their, their behavior, their preferences, um, and then the organization in response changing how they connect with the customer. So I think that's, that's the core. The core is the why, and the why starts with, with, with the customer. Um, I mean, some of this is really obvious, you know, for a nonprofit doing fundraising in, in Canada. There's the obvious opportunity of long-term, low-cost, sustainable revenue. 
digital is that opportunity. Uh, digital is also a great opportunity to just simply spread our message. Social media allows us to, to, to connect so quickly. Part of our journey, and thanks for sharing the slide, uh, part of our journey was actually to shift in our mentality, not only, uh, not only uh, as we become customer-centric, to shift how we think from product-centric, that was the primary way how we divided, organized, communicated, to be customer-centric. Start with the customer and understand where they are at and go from there. Um, <clears throat> so that was, I would say, hand-in-hand, hand, the customer-centric change, transformation, and digital transformation kind of hand-in-hand. In, hand. in terms of the actual steps of what happened, I think it happens the same way for everybody. The CIO simply realizes, or the, chi, or the COO simply realizes, well, we need to do this. We don't have a clear understanding. We need someone to guide the process. We need someone that can, that has more information about the strange creature that we don't understand. So it's this uh, fundamental understanding we need some help. And whether the help comes from someone like me or whether the help comes from partner, it's to get that help. So in our case, yeah, our CIO posted this position. It's not common to find you know, uh, this type of position uh, when, you're, when you're looking for work. And then jumping in, and jumping in uh, is kind of common, understanding the who, who the, what are the key objectives, why are we doing this? Uh, sorry, uh, understanding the why, what are the key objectives, why are we doing this? Why is the customer changing? Then, uh, you know, who are the key players here? And what are they trying to do? And then how are they trying to accomplish it? And accepting that the how would keep changing. And as we adopt more digital, like transform digitally, it will keep changing over the time. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, one of the things that was difficult and it was, I would say, the next step after, after you acquire certain amounts of information is simply deciding on what's important. Because you have your operations, your revenue targets, and then you have the strategic vision on change and trying to navigate these two. And one of the things that was quite practical for us, was meaningful for us, is just simply making a stand on, here are the priorities, here's all the activities, here's all the priorities, and make that visible to, to the, uh, to all staff. Um, research is really helpful, uh, whether it's NetHope's research or even industry research. Uh, I know later we'll probably go through some of that. Uh, partners are really helpful. And there are multiple layers. Part of the difficulty, complexity, part of the, the messy middle that JAL is talking about is the fact that, yeah, it, there is a lot. There's different pillars. It's not just technology, it's people, culture, process. And you're all going to have to reinvent how you think about the financing. It's more about investment than financing. So there is a lot of different dimensions or basically pillars. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think it's a single journey. And uh, I like the NetHope's DNA research, the digital nonprofit ability. It has different quadrants and talk about how different nonprofits travel through different journeys to become digitally transformed. I actually think that within every organization there are multiple divisions, multiple people that have their own journey to arrive at that final destination. Uh, and it's about how do you come together. You will have the IT person that's looking at from the technology point of view, and for us there was CRM. You have another team, operations team, that looks at from the automation. Then you have maybe a marketing team that looks at the connectivity and customer centricity. And eventually, we engage and we meet and we figure out and we find something wonderful. Um, I know for World Vision, what was the DNA research was helpful. I know Scott Nails, who's the chief technology innovator for World Vision International, uses that framework and is trying to circulate and uh, get all the other national offices sharing as well. Um, yeah. I, I, I just want to. Yeah, I just want to reinforce. It's multiple stories for those first steps. It's multiple stories of, of people get getting there. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, I think it's really great to hear that you start with why. Uh, you know, the why to transform, and starting with the what. Uh, I think too often we want to jump right in and start transforming the what with not a real sense of, of purpose or reason why. So it's glad to hear that you took those. Um, you know, that came to part of your decision-making process and then that carried forward yeah, initial sure. um, steps forward. Uh, 
the jail, um, you know, Nat Hope, I'm sure, has plenty of uh, research. You know, Adam mentioned research as being critical here, uh, research and assessment. Anything you can add to the conversation? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, um, a chart that shows the result, the summary of our digital nonprofit ability assessment, um, a, a tool that we use to find out where people were at along the dimensions of people, process, technology, data, and investment, the same dimensions that World Vision is using internally. And uh, what we can see here across two dimensions, the vertical beneficiary focus, which is the classic externally focused and the horizontal operational focus, which is the internally focused dimensions. What we see is where the average of everybody stands up. So a couple of things. First, the black square tells us, hey, we're really close to digital transformation. So in aggregate, in average, uh, you know, we should really learn from each other. But also, it gives us two words of warning, the blue square and the green square. Um, which is uh, process and people. It says essentially that uh, process and people are the two single elements that are preventing us from moving forward into digital transformation. And let's spend a little bit of a time on the people side of things. Uh, anybody who um, tells you that uh, to deal with people, one in the nonprofit could just cut and paste what can be read about the for-profit customer comes first you should remind them that we have two constituents in the nonprofit and not one. And that makes our work so difficult, where we have to resolve the tension between those and the balance and others. And then even if we have staff, many of us deliver through partners and volunteers, which complexifies also the internal dimensions. But most importantly, uh, when we deal with people, we tend to employ people of very long spans of time. I just met with um, some World Vision folks in, uh, in Uganda, for example, who had been employed there for, um, you know, close to like 30 years in the, in the positions that they hold. And, and with that comes um, an important culture in our organization. And as people are the core of our organizations and the culture is shaped, what we really have to think is how we move the culture forward. And, um, and um, Adam, I'd like you um, to share with us um, how you've contributed to that at uh, World Vision Canada and your project. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe I, I can make the question a little bit broader. Is how do you handle that topic? Uh, as opposed to just uh, focus on me. Um, it's probably one of the biggest topics as far as transformation for nonprofit because nonprofits have such strong culture. Um, and this is where the why becomes really important. The why must inspire, not just justify the what, the disruption that you are making. So whatever transformation you're doing, the why becomes very, very important. Um, it should motivate the staff to, for them to change without effort almost. Um, if, they, if your staff understand the purpose, then they'll be willing to change. Um, and I can oversimplify that. I can use Simon Sinek's uh, you know, it starts with why, but I think the process is like that. If if you can focus on the why first, then the how, then the what, uh, you'll be more successful in changing the culture. Uh, we often default to what because it's familiar, it has less ambiguity. This is why we sometimes default to, to technology. We know that tool, we know that interface, it's tangible, I can see it. Uh, but our staff actually don't have that amount of vision, don't have that information. So for them, you have to create an emotive, powerful why to help them change. They have to be partners. They can't simply be participants. Um, and part of that change that is actually easier for nonprofits is embracing the fact that because middle upper management doesn't have all the information, you need a different way of managing. You need managers to become servant leaders because it's the actual staff that have more of the information. Um, so I think that's, that's the core components as far as how do you get adoption, how do you change the culture, how do you, how do you get staff to, to buy in uh, and take advantage of the culture as opposed to go against it.
Hey, great. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, Jail. Um, some great insights on how do you start your journey. Um, heard, you know, start with why, heard, uh, assess, uh, people, process, uh, technology, all of the pillars to come up with the right plan. And the initial steps would be executing against that plan. Uh, however, no doubt digital transformation, you know, is challenging. You know, you have to embrace it. You can't fear it. And you will probably really feel at times and question yourselves, you know, are you really on the right path? You know, I bet the journey, Adam, right now at times has been very rocky. Uh, I would doubt <laughs> that it's been very smooth. Um, you probably had to explore, experiment, adapt, execute, um, and change uh, in order to get yourself uh, and, you know, world vision back on um, course if you've ever come off course. So can you, Adam, can you help the members understand how World Vision Canada um, continues to feel like you're heading in the right direction and walk us through how you navigate, you know, on a daily basis, monthly basis, this uncharted, ter uncharted territory known as digital transformation. Sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, we want to, we look for a way that's both, it has to be objective, it has to be measurable, it has to be, uh, there has to be some level of certainty around how do we know we're on the right track. Uh, so for us, there's, I, I want to share kind of two, two, two aspects. One of them is if information is what's lacking, it's what you have the least, then one of the big pieces is this transparency of information. And we do this in, in a number of ways. Uh, we, for example, our results, our dash, we have a dashboard KPI. We have that up on our walls. So everybody can see uh, what are the different measures are as far as acquisition, conversion, retention. Those are visible to all staff at any point of time. Uh, <clears throat> we come together on a quarterly basis. So we create this cadence of quarterly meetings. And uh, the picture, if you can just flip back one, I did a picture of one of the meetings when we regroup and we sync and we share openly. So this is part of the ways how we accept ambiguity and embrace this iterative uh, uh, planning process where we review back what are KPIs, how are we doing? We look at the next quarter, what are the top priorities? What do we need to focus on? Uh, which is very difficult to say these are the most important things. Uh, then we actually plan out the work to capacity, and this has really been instrumental in being successful in actually delivering and tracking and ensuring that we're on, on track. Is uh, we plan to a capacity. We know how much we can handle. Uh, of course, we measure and review conflicts. And then we, at the end, because this is, again, information is spread across all of us, all of us have to commit. So literally in the meeting, we jointly commit to that one shared plan. And that really brings us together. It helps us to stay online, uh, uh, on, on target. It helps buy-in. It, and it also, uh, high engagement, high involvement from, from all staff. Now behind it, there's more. Uh, I don't know, probably don't have time here, but behind this, you know, there are tools that enable this. There are dashboards that uh, are fueled by different technologies. Uh, what I want to iterate in this one, though, is that there isn't a necessarily a 100-page strategy for how to achieve digital transformation, because you simply don't have the information. The strategy is the plan and process, plan and process, plan and process, plan and process. The, the iterative aspect of engaged planning and processing based on data. Um, and the, the other thing that may be of use that, uh, to, to, to others on uh, listening and that has been really useful to us is the idea, how do you measure? How do you, what kind of KPIs do you use in ambiguity, in something like transformation? And so, uh, if you think about uh, venture capitalists, they're also in a scenario when they, when they try to invest and fund high risk, high unknowns, high opportunity. And they use the concepts of gates. And that works for us quite well. We incorporate gates into these quarterly meetings. But gates are a holistic set of predetermined criteria or specific business objectives. Sometimes they're revenue, sometimes they're not revenue. But you're judging the, whether you're on track with transformation and judging the effectiveness of transformation using these predefined criteria 
that you are going to define ahead of time when you're not biased and not emotional, and then you're literally using that same criteria at the end of the quarter or at the end of the six months to say, how are we tracking? Do we have, are we staying on course? Do we pivot? And for us, again, the criteria varies, but some of this will be obvious. So do we meet our quarterly business objectives? And we actually have a numerical score for that. And uh, since, we, some of the, since we implemented some of these changes, our score doubled from 40s to, to 80s. So that's one of the tangible ways how to measure that. Measure staff productivity, capacity, is an increase in decreasing staff engagement uh, and adoption. And of course, we measure revenue, uh, <clears throat> digital revenue, other revenue, cost per acquisition, and ultimately how much money we send to, to the field, to the people that benefit from, from, from the money that, that we raise. Um, information becomes very powerful in here. It's, it's changing how we make decisions from idea-based decisions and strategies to data and insight and evidence-driven strategy and changes even how we do marketing. Um, so, kind of summarize, but I'm actually curious, especially for NetHope, NetHope you are you're doing, you know, you, similar types of questions from a number of, of nonprofits. How, how do you think about this? How do you, how do you help other nonprofits tackle this, the same question? Yes, um, uh, I mean, uh, but on, um, on this, what you, you have to think about is um, that um, while the why is the utmost important part of it, um, uh, because it sets the directions. Um, everybody has heard, you know, the famous sentence of all path go to Rome, right? The, the why is Rome. The path doesn't really matter. Um, can relate to this slide. I, I mean, here, um, everybody's trying to get to the digital nonprofit, but the path is very different for any one of them. Not only for any one of them, but any department within the organization. So to be clear on the why, is perhaps the most important thing, as you mentioned uh, there. A big why makes a matter. I'll quote here uh, uh, somebody uh, like Frederick Nietzsche, who said, you know, um, a person who has a why to live for um, can bear almost any how. And, and it's true that the how can be complicated, but the why is what's going to drive people. So uh, my recommendation is stake the mark of the why. Stake the point of the true nonprofit where you're doing it. And then accept that the how will be complex. It will be um, something for which you will need each other as departments, but also as NetHope members to call upon each other to find out who has done what in that situation. And then, um, and then there's a great risk, as I mentioned at the beginning, to kind of completely get lost into it. All too often we get lost because uh, perhaps at times digital transformation can become a very academic exercise and it's easy to try to define it at a turnum and then to be bogged down into this versus just doing it and enjoying it and moving forward. And so for that, we will need references such as the one that Scott um, and uh, Adam have presented here today. And then, and then finally, the most important thing is um, no single nonprofit will go through exactly the same steps uh, to get there, but one will always be in one step say on data or people or processes or technology or investment, one step ahead of the others. One will have managed to, for example, secure some funds from the organization. Another one will have figured out what type of communication and skills to do with people. And this is where we all become guides. At one point in our journey, we're ahead of the others. And let's not forget that by becoming those guys, we have a reasonable moral mandate there that says that uh, we should do, all do it together and turn back and say, hey, I have done this, and whomever is about to engage in this step can call me and share that with me. Um, this was different with the, the tech-enabled nonprofit because, as we can see from this slide, um, a lot of what we used to deal with in technology was relatively broad, low order technology, power network, managing the network, putting some apps on the network, securing those things. It didn't require complex skills or complex processes. Just think about it, right? At the early days, right, um, it was a matter of having an RJ45 cable and looking in the back 
of a computer and figuring out where that's plugged in, right? And there was a serial port and there was a parallel port and there was a, you know, a power port and there was probably a couple of other things, like a node connector and others. And everybody figured out where to put the RJ45 into, right? Because it was a matter of just physics and the technical literacy was low. And, and it's pretty much the same when you think of the desktop suite. But now let's consider more higher complex services that we're standing up today. You know, the, the complex services that we're doing uh, a full ERP, for example, implementation or, uh, or decision making tools, which allow people to broadly make decisions on themselves. Thinks of uh, products like uh, Splunk and Tableau and, uh, and, uh, and others that, uh, that allows you to, to manipulate the data. And think about the skills then that you're requiring of the people on this. So, um, so to me, the, the more the technology increases in almost simplicity, where as the dashboard we saw before is relatively simple at a representation of circles and bar chart and others, the more complex it becomes in terms of skills, because then you have to start to navigate into that. And, uh, and your compass is your why, uh, but your how is, is all over the board. And so that this is where network members can really give each other some good references on how they master the step. No, absolutely, and you know I completely agree. Um, you know, as the technology you know elevates, the technology becomes more powerful. You definitely have to address the other two sides, the people side, uh, the process side. I think the dashboard is a great example. Jay, as you said. You know, when you, just by the mere introduction of a dashboard isn't going to make you data driven. People still need to have the skills to be able to interpret and understand the, the data and the KPIs that are being presented. And even the people to analyze actually mm -hmm. get into that format to begin with. Um, you know, I agree with Adam around, you know, transparency, shared accountability, you know, collaborative process to co-create a plan when we all buy in. It, it makes it very hard not to achieve. You've got shared accountability. Um, absolutely, the the plan, you know, plan your capacity. Um, if you know your capacity, you know how much you can achieve, and whether you need more resources um, or not. I mean, that's a key tenant of our own platform and our own approach um, at Easy Projects. And I think what I would leave with, because um, I was reminded of a story of. Uh, as you were both speaking, it, from, a specific, uh, from a specific customer in which they introduced uh, a dashboard and introduced sharing of information. And what they found is when the information became accessible, it really prompted people to act. Mm -hmm. Because it's very hard to yep. ignore uh, the dashboard and the insights that it's showing you. Um, at least you can't ignore it collectively. And what was interesting when they, this customer um, when they started to share information collectively, an unintended benefit was they actually started to see employee stress drop. Yep. And they measured it, and they saw it drop 20%. So unintended consequences of you know, thinking of the why, sharing information, and that it actually can lead to uh, for us, yeah. uh, emotional stress. So I think that's, um, you know, again, very interesting, um, very uh, unintended, but very valuable. So thank you again. I'll thank you for those insights. Um, let's bring this conversation full circle. Um, you know, Adam, can you reflect on your last three years? You've shared a lot, but can you maybe share some additional key learnings uh, with the members uh, in terms of uh, what would you do the same or what would you do again? Did you see uh, any unexpected benefits or challenges as you were digitally transforming? Uh, and is there anything you do differently? Sure, thank you. Um, I think I want to start by saying there's absolutely benefits that we realized from this, both ones we expected did not expect. The one that you mentioned, we ourselves maybe did not expect to be as large, and we have experienced to be as large, TT morale as they became more, more empowered and they had more information, yeah, they experienced less stress and uh, they were a lot more positive. Um, we increased, incre you know, higher revenue and all those types of things, uh, higher 
success rate as far as even what we plan versus what, what we achieve. It's, it's, it is messy. It's, it's, there are obviously challenges. The biggest challenge is probably common. It's the constantly negotiating between the short-term practical revenue side or operation side and the long-term strategic play for, hey, how do we have to transform? How do we, how do we evolve? How do we innovate? And that gets messy. And you, you, you need good, good partners for that. Um, what to do the same versus different? I think, and I, I primarily done prior to this digital transformation for privates. So one of my biggest epiphanies, uh, there's actually, sorry, the, the, there's two. One that JA mentioned, none of the frameworks I knew worked here for nonprofits. They, 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 they don't. It's a very different dynamic. Uh, and, and the other one, as far as what would I do differently, the purpose is so strong. People are so purpose-driven here that I would spend even more time on, on educating, engaging, and driving the why and taking advantage of the culture. Um, one of the, the dysfunctions that I did find, or maybe dysfunctions is the right word, one of the common issues that I did find as far as learnings to share with the community is <clears throat> Nonprofits, many nonprofits, I'm not going to say all nonprofits, but many nonprofits have a gift of solving complex, sorry, solving unknowns with complexity, solving ambiguity with complexity. Whereas if you actually, we actually need to do the opposite. We need to, right after the why, we need to start with simplification. <clears throat> what we already do day to day is already difficult. We already are our resource poor, capacity poor. We can't layer another something very different like transformation without simplifying our processes, without decreasing our capacity, without <clears throat> like making it more sane for our staff. Um, and I guess something that I want to end with as a tool that I've used here very effectively and I also shared through Imagine Canada, if you guys want to read my blog post there is, yeah, frameworks don't work. But there's an approach that makes sense for nonprofits, and that's the approach that I have published on, on called Heartbeat. And it's quite simple. Think of it, again, it's iteratively. As your heart beats, your blood runs through your veins, through your hand. You start with the big thumb. The big thumb is the purpose. That's the why. You have to start with that. Without the thumb, you won't be able to do a ton of stuff. Uh, then you have to simplify. You have to simplify before you explore and, and then execute. You have to explore because you're doing something new. You don't have all the information, so you have to start with exploration before you do execution. And after that, to come for circle, you have to use the data that you just acquired. You have to share the information, learn from that, and adapt. And again, come back for circle. Another heartbeat runs through your hand, and you do it again and again and again. And that's the only approach that has made sense, that has been successful, uh, which I've shared. How does that sound? <laughs> uh, I think that sounds great. Um, I think I definitely agree with simplification. Uh, I think I'm guilty of it at times too. You want to, you think you've got a big problem, so you need complexity to solve the big problem. And that time, that just simplifies is the right course. Way it, to go, go. it goes back to GAL's chart, right? The more complexity in the, in the technology, the more people you need, the more complex skill sets you need. So it becomes un, not sustainable. Exactly. Yeah. And keep it simple. Um, so great insight so far on the importance of focusing on people and focusing on process, uh, giving us uh, a process that we can uh, follow uh, to guide our execution. So thank you, Adam, for that. Um, one item that we've kind of touched on uh, briefly but haven't really dove into, and that's the role of technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, technology is part of the solution. So Adam, can you maybe, from a nonprofit perspective, uh, you've talked about partnerships. Mm -hmm. you know, can you talk about finding and selecting the right partner um, to support a journey like this? Sure. Yeah, I, I don't think you can avoid this topic. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> especially when you see how many uh, how many digital transformations fail. So what you have up on a slide is uh, research by by Forrester from 2016. How many, how many companies are actually ready to execute? And you see significant gaps here. Uh, 
And technology is, let's start with this, technology is an enabler of change. <clears throat> at, at the end of the day, as far as what you, what you look at the, 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 the DNA research that has with technology automation, or even if you think about that often what you're actually changing is, is, is processes, <clears throat> it's technology that, that fuels that. And it's not the thing you want to start with, but it sometimes is the quick win. Sometimes it is the catalyst for change. Sometimes it's the easiest thing to change because it already has, for example, best practices built in. <clears throat> so sometimes a single technology change can actually make a big impact and propel someone in the right direction. As far as picking partners, <clears throat> I mean, I think we all have standard procurement practices, so maybe it's about, I think what's more relevant is the criteria that we look for partners. And we say partners, not vendors. And it makes sense. When you look at all the pillars, all the dimensions, you need partners. Um, you can't necessarily delegate the accountability, but we do look for people that first understand the nonprofit because private methods don't necessarily work for us. Uh, we also look for partners that believe in our mission, that are genuinely uh, emotionally attached to our why. Um, and then, yeah, then we look at do you have a proven record in the culture, people, process, tech, data, investment. And we find the more holistic partners are better for the long journey. And same thing with, with, with technology. If you pick technology for the right now, you kind of miss that you're going to keep evolving and you don't have all the information right now. You need to pick technology that's going to grow with you. It's going to keep evolving with you. Um, and that's one of the challenges. Uh, we have a lot of legacy systems that cannot evolve. And we, can, we feel pressure to change the legacy systems. But sometimes I look at our RFP process and the next system, we're still picking the same way how we picked our 20-year-old legacy system. And that, that just doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Our systems are not going to stay around for 20 years. Lucky if they'll stay for five. So, yeah, that's a big challenge. I'm actually curious, uh, Easy Projects, you're more on the supportive side, right? You're, you probably know the story. You live the story every day. But how do you manage this? How, you know, how do you articulate that conflict and help the clients? Yeah, uh, Adam, um, you know, we, we see that every day. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I would say, we talk to far too many organizations, for-profit, non-profit, that have simply hit a wall uh, with yeah. a product that they probably bought to solve a very specific need, uh, and they've come to the realization that it's not going to join them on their journey move, moving forward, yeah. and they have to replace. And it's a really tough decision. I don't think any CIO out, out there wants to admit they made a wrong choice, <laughs> and they don't want to now have to get involved in solving breakage issues rather than build and expand and evolve. Um, and that's what I really like about Easy Projects. Um, absolutely love the fact that we are have built um, a product that really strikes the right balance between today and tomorrow. And I think we do a few things really, really well. One is this concept of being flexible and configurable. Uh, in the sense that if you want to change the product, you don't need advanced degrees to do so. Basically, the average person with average technology skills can do that. So when you talked about simplification or simplify, mm -hmm. and JL talked about as you evolve your tech, you need to evolve your processes and your people, our approach allows you to not have to uh, elevate or go through that um, escalation, I think, as quickly as possible. But it can slow you down. It can go at your right pace because you're going to be throwing a lot of change, you know, at people, you know, as you know, and they, they can only handle uh, so much. Not only is our platform flexible, but I also like our people. You know, it's very uh, flexible. We have a very strong focus on adoption. We do understand that people can only handle so much change. So we operate from an onboarding perspective at your pace. And again, that helps reduce the stress like we talked about um, earlier. Uh, maybe from my own perspective, a story I can share um, why I'm excited to be here and excited to be partnering with Easy Pro uh, Mighty, partnering with NetHope um, is that I really like to give back. I like really like to play it forward. Hmm. Um, I do it here. I like to share information to make other people better. 
uh, a story that I told uh, a few people the other day was a story about uh, the there's a community out there around robotics in high schools uh, where not only do teams compete from a high school perspective, but they go and they share information and try to make other teams better even though you're competing. And I just really like that sense of purpose of making everyone better in that type of environment. So I guess, Adam, thanks for the question. I'm not sure if I answered it um, or it's not. It's not an easy question. No. Um, but definitely the thinking of balancing today and tomorrow is, is really key. You do need technology that can evolve with you. You need technology that's going to be with you. Uh, you need an organization that's going to listen. And I think easy projects from platform perspective achieve that, being very flexible and very configurable. That's one of our strengths. But also our customer-centric approach to our roadmap where we listen to feedback. We have a customer council uh, where that input from customers help shape the product the best of all so that the product can evolve you know, with our customers. Cool. Thank you. So before we wrap up and address uh, some questions, um, and thank you everyone for your, um, for your time today. Uh, Adam and JL, can you share some final words of wisdom with the members? Sure. They're happy to help the, the community. So I have the slide that I use, uh, Scott just brought up, and I want you to imagine you're climbing Mount Everest with a group of people, uh, and you're on this trail. You just left base camp. <clears throat> the snow keeps shifting, so there's no trail. You don't know necessarily. The only thing that you do have clarity on is that mountain that's right in front of you, this big, humongous peak. And that's kind of what it feels like sometimes on this journey of digital transformation. Uh, you don't want just one guide because something could happen to the guide. <laughs> you have multiple guides. You want to, and you have multiple people in this journey. So the why has to be far greater than the what. It's not a matter of justifying the disruption. It's a matter of inspiring people so you don't have to justify the disruption. The why, that peak, that mountain has to be so crystal clear, so powerful, so emotive, that it inspires the change almost as if you didn't have to make them do it or convince them to, to, to do it. Make them do it is the wrong word. Second one is you have to accept ambiguity and uncertainty ahead. You, the messy middle that, that Yale talked about is the fact that the snow keeps shifting. The weather conditions will keep changing. Uh, and you have to be okay with that. You have to, in fact, be energized by it at, the, uh, at that un un uncertainty. Third one is, <clears throat> you're doing all this change in the middle of everything else happening, and, and there is no perfect time. There is no perfect team. You wish, hey, if I just hired person X that had skill set Y, it would be so much different. No, actually, just starting and moving and introducing changing is more important. So there's no perfect time or team or place. Just start going. Fourth one is uh, don't settle on simply changing the culture. <clears throat> uh, you will have to keep changing. It's not like uh, digital transformation is three years and you're done. The customer will keep changing, technology will keep changing. What's far more important is actually to create a culture of change and the resilience that comes with it and the openness that comes with it. <clears throat> and the fifth one, you're going to be in the messy middle for a long time, especially because it keeps changing. You have to learn how to appreciate and enjoy the journey, not just the destination. You can't go at it simply for that peak that you haven't reached at, that you see in the distance. You have to enjoy the snow and, and the wind and the camaraderie. You have to be there for the journey as well. So it's kind of a five main points to share. Uh, thanks, Adam. Uh, JL, any final thoughts from you? Yeah, I want, I want to bring uh, two thoughts um, <clears throat> that echo what um, um, Adam has said in the past. Um, one, one is about simplicity, and I want to give you a little bit of a recipe there. Right? You, you cannot digitally transform something a thousand percent. Right? It's just nobody has that sheer willpower. Uh, you know, it, it'd be like to take this analogy that uh, Adam is presenting us, like climbing Everest in a day. 
just doesn't happen, right? But what you can do is what those people are doing in front of us, which is take one step at a time, and you can change a thousand little things by 1% digitally and get the same effect. So what does it translate for you, right? Sometimes teaching a team how to gain agility by looking at data might not sound like a big deal. You're sitting with five to 10 people, you're showing them the data, you're showing them that the data changed, they can change the processes and they can evolve around it, and then you leave. And it may not be a lot, but if you repeat that enough in the organization, pretty quickly the entire organization could be a data-driven organization, be agile as the data moves, and then look back in a few years and say, hmm, how did we work before? I'll give you a model that we've all experienced in our own lifetime, which is the model of the smartphone, right? Today we use those things like they've been with us since we were born. The reality is they're about a little bit more than 10 years old, right? And how would we work before there was a mobile phone? We, we kind of forget because we, we just don't conceptualize that. And in fact, if you ask kids, you, said, you mean you had to stop at a specific place to make a phone call? That doesn't make sense. So that change of 1% a thousand times versus a thousand percent change is really important for simplicity. So try to simplify it. And the, la the second one is a mantra that I keep repeating at NetHope is we here at 57 organizations we do more collectively than any single organizations can potentially do. And so I, I want to bring that ancient African proverb to remind us that, you know, if you want to go fast, you should go alone. But if you want to go far, it's better to do it together. Thanks. Well, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, JL. Um, I think we all can do that. I think. Climbing Everest is a great example of that. You won't get very far. Nope. Trying to do it alone. Um, great recipe to die. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> so one quick uh, item that I would share, uh, this is from a technology standpoint, and it's uh, avoiding what we call at Easy Projects the adoption cliff. Um, unfortunately, I believe uh, a lot of project and work management uh, products in this space will simply sell you the software tell you good luck as you go and self-enable. Um, and the belief is that it's, in, it's easy to use, it's intuitive, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, easy projects, we're different. We actually understand that it's beyond technology, that there's people and process involved, and we are actually known for our change management and adoption practices. Because what we understand is one, everyone is different, like we talked about earlier. Uh, change needs to feel intuitive, and introducing new software is a change management uh, exercise. And we also believe that if you don't manage the process, much like you don't manage and don't have oversight over a broader digital transformation initiative, that the actual initiative will fail. And from a technology standpoint, if it fails, you're not going to get the benefits that you believe you're going to get because you're going to fall off the cliff um, by the graphic on the left. But if you can bridge that gap and avoid that cliff, you will get uh, evolve with the software, you will achieve uh, benefits now and in the future and continue to receive those benefits because the platform evolves with you. Uh, and I can share a white paper if the audience is, is interested uh, after the webinar. So Scott, just this is perfect. We, yeah, yeah we, we, we're running very tight on time, but I, there's a few questions that's come in, and uh, I'd love to have uh, Adam and the rest of you address it, uh, address uh, sure. at least one of them. Sure. So, uh, could you yeah, could you go back to the the people, process, and technology slide, the ones with the three pyramids that are stacked? Um, in the, the the question was the last one that came in. It says uh, the digital people skills. Um, the digital people skills are listed on the people process technology slide, uh, and uh, particularly Adam, how would you prioritize those skills in your environment? So the, the, the skills are list, listed on the left there. Uh, sorry, is the question prioritized between people skills and technology or between? No, uh, it would be the people the skills. skills section. The, the people skills, the, the, the leftmost sure. column or the leftmost, yeah. So. 
complex problem solving, creativity, and innovation, and so on and so forth. Hmm. That's a difficult issue. I, so, I mean, I do appreciate that uh, that there are larger, perhaps larger skill gaps in nonprofits. Um, <clears throat> for me, if I, for me, that's contextual to a specific scenario. So, if you want me to prioritize it, I would prioritize it differently for one nonprofit versus another nonprofit. Um, for example, you may have a medium-sized nonprofit that is pretty far up in the complexity for technology, then yes, skills become more important. You may have a small nonprofit, whether or not, they're actually most of their engagements with customers or direct in, in, engagements, technology is less important, Connect, connectivity is less important, where those skill sets are not as important. So I'm not trying to avoid the question, I just kind of, I really believe that it, that's different per nonprofit. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but what we probably could do, we ask JL, uh, NetOp has done some research on this, and maybe JL, you sure. can uh, explain a little bit what we found out as we've been uh, uh, researching over 50 organizations uh, and their uh, uh, capabilities along these uh, skills groups. Yeah, we just interviewed more than 300 people on this and from 50 organizations. I mean, one thing that is pretty clear, everybody gets that one, right? Without technical literacy, don't even start digital transformation, right? That ain't gonna work. It's like, with that power and connectivity, don't even start the system, right? And so technical literacy is kind of a fundamental one, right? But we surprisingly finding out that we're doing pretty well as a sector on this. What was surprising to us is the entrepreneurial spirit, which is essentially gaining agility and being able to try things with a big outcome like Mount Everest, was the one that we were collectively, in average, doing the weakest on. And so it's kind of a, that um, why that uh, Adam just spoke about, which is uh, you know learning how to set up whys and accepting that as we try those big, massive, transformative whys, um, we're going to have to try a lot um, to get to the summit of that. Um, that is something that is difficult in our sector to do in average. Um, so I would prioritize that one as the first one above, you know, technical literacy being like a base fundamental and then uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, would be the the first one I would put on top of that. Yeah, it, it may also be worth uh, mentioning that uh, the term socially responsible uh, is uh, also more geared towards being socially responsible and, and, and dealing with data, particularly as we deal with beneficiary data, donor data, and things like that. So make sure yeah. we take, don't take that out of context. Everybody within the, uh, the sector are very socially responsible from a personal perspective, but this is really targeted towards data and, and, and protecting uh, our stakeholders. Uh, we, we are getting uh, towards the, the very top of the hour. Um, uh, the, the Scott, um, uh, any, any uh, last minute questions or last minute comments from you before we round this up? So I think uh, if, there's much, uh, if there are more questions, uh, can I ask the panel if they would commit to providing answers after the webinar? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah for I'll, sure. I'll, I'll capture them all and uh, we'll make sure that I, I get them to you and we can okay. post the question and answer document on the Solution Center when we, uh, when we post the slides and the recording later on today. Or okay, when, perfect. When, when you have a chance to answer them. Okay, perfect. So we will commit to doing that uh, for the members. Uh, and to wrap up, uh, I think what we want to express as a panel is feel free to keep the conversation going. Uh, reach out to us. Uh, the email that you'll receive a little later with the recording will also include our contact information. Feel free to reach out to us, engage with us. Uh, also, a really quick reminder of the NetHope Global Summit. Uh, happening in Dublin, Ireland, November. Uh, please plan to attend. Uh, make sure you come by the Solution Center. Uh, we will be happy as Easy Projects to, you know, further the conversation and, and talk um, talk this from a technology perspective, but also process and people. And maybe a second reminder: if you're not aware, um, there are some. We are a member of the. Um, Frederick, I always get this wrong. The Digital Solution Area, I believe it's called. Um, the Center for the Digital Nonprofit. Yes, 
Thank you. Um, where we do have some uh, special offers available to uh, NetHope members. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, JL. And thank you to the audience for uh, excellent questions and interaction today. So we will leave it at that. Um, have a great rest of the, uh, the day. And uh, if you can take a couple of minutes to answer the webinar satisfaction poll, that would be terrific. Uh, we'll be back in touch soon with uh, more webinars coming up. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.